name is Irene Mallet, ne Guiton. Um, I was born in Jersey because my father was a Jerseyman. Uh, I kept, but my mother came back from India, where we lived in India, uh, for my birth because father insisted that his daughters should be born in Jersey, so they were Jersey people. So she came back and I was born uh, in October 1934. Um, and then I went back to India and then eventually came back here when my sister started school. And that was really just at the beginning of the war. And so uh, father went back to India because he had to join up with his regiment. And I stayed here with my mother. Most of our relatives evacuated. My my grandmother, Clara Bedane, and um, my sister went with her and my cousin and aunt. And so I was left here with my mother and we lived at uh, Lagi Emery, which is up at St. Saviour's, where, where my, my uncle Leslie farmed there. I remember the beginning of the war very clearly because um, we had to put a white sheet out on the lawn to say that we'd surrendered. So we, we put the white sheet out on the lawn and I was really looking forward to seeing what happened next, you know, because I, I was five at the time. And, uh, and a few days after the, the Germans landed and it was really a sort of disastrous month for the whole of Jersey. And my occupation began quite literally with a bang. I was five years old and my mother and George, who would become my stepfather, decided to take me to the Forum Cinema to see The Wizard of Oz. My memories of the film itself are rather hazy, but I'll never forget the scene when the Wicked Witch appears amid a great flash of fire and a loud bang. At that instant, the lights in the cinema were dimmed, the manager came onto the stage to tell us that the harbour was being bombed and we must leave the cinema immediately. As far as I can remember, there was no panic. We all trooped out and the three of us piled into George's car and we drove to Victoria College, the boys' school which stands on the hill overlooking, well, you probably know that. And from the heights, we could see the fires blazing in the town and the harbour. The Germans had bombed La Roque also and their planes had swept, swept low over the island with machine guns blazing. Ten people were killed that day. It's a miracle that there were not more deaths, really. At first, Mother and I lived in the cottage at Laugiomri, and but then we moved in quite soon. We moved into my stepfather's. He had a small terraced house at First Tower, and we moved in there. And my stepfather, he'd, he'd left school when he was about 11, I think, but um, he's a very enterprising man, and he saw right at the beginning that what we needed was land and somewhere to grow, grow our crops and feed ourselves because little terraced house at, at first hour wasn't going to produce much. And somehow he managed to buy this beautiful farm at um, Montcouchon, called the Priory. And I, don't, I think he paid about £400 for it, which is probably worth several million today. And so we moved in there and that's how my occupation began. We grew our vegetables and fruit. Mother kept hens, so we, we always had eggs. She didn't like killing her hens, so she always cried if she had to kill a hen. And then we had a cow, or cows. And um, so we didn't starve, that was the main thing. We were not that, uh, we, we managed. But we had great neighbors and I used to play with all the children. We had an extra hour of daylight in the war because we took on the French time. I, I had a pony and trap, I remember, which I had when I was about eight. A little pony and little, oh, she was beautiful. Bess, she was called. And there we were. And, and also we had some, some good friends that moved into part of the house. Uh, they, they actually lived just at the end of the, the drive down here in what is now La Tiebo, that big house, you know. Mm. But in those days, it was just a tiny little cottage, little fisherman's cottage. And it was, you know, he had to cycle 
Jack and I had to cycle into work every day, which was really far too far for him. So they moved in with his his two his his wife, Bora, Deborah. Everybody calls Deborah's Debbie now, but she was known as Bora. <laughs> and uh, the two sons, Mal Malcolm and Brian, the man. And uh, they were my friends, and we used to do all lots of things together. And and one of the things we did with our pony and trap was to go down and get seawater in milk cans because we had no salt then, you see, so we had to go and get the, the seawater. And while we were there, we always picked limpets and cockles off the, off the rocks, which were good for feeding the cats. Uh, one day I remember that, um, my, oh, and then of course, yes, my my, dad, my stepfather was, well, he wasn't my stepfather then, but he became my stepfather, George, and he was in the fields, doing some work in the fields, and mum was in the house, and she got a knock at the door, and there was a German officer with two Gestapo's with him. Well, I think they were Gestapo's, we were always told they were, and uh, they said, uh, uh, we would like to come in, please. Uh, we believe you have a radio. And Mum said, no, no, we haven't got a radio. We would like to come in. So I came in, walked up the stairs, went into the bathroom, uh, opened the airing cupboard, pulled back the pile of towels and sheets, and sure enough, there was the radio. So they said, I am very sorry, you have bad friends. That was what the officer said to my mum. So obviously somebody had told them exactly where the radio was and that was. So anyway, George had uh, was sentenced to six months in jail. I used to go and see him in jail and take him something, I'm not sure what. We sort of tried to cook something, I don't, I don't know what hard work, but anyway. Uh, and he was very lucky that he wasn't deported like most, most of the people were. I think the reason was that the the harvest was due to be brought in and we had quite a lot of wheat and it was very important to get the harvest in and so he wasn't the only um, uh, the only farmer who was released from from prison but he was released so I think he served about 4 months altogether he was very lucky he wasn't like the the painter family for instance and all the other various people who were sent off to to Germany or France and never seen again. You know. D Day was a great day. We we were down at Millbrook. I remember we and we saw all these lights flashing, and uh, and it was I, I don't quite know why. It, it seemed to be over over from Millbrook, looking out there, we could see lights flashing. I'm not quite sure what that would be because it wasn't St Malo or the Normandy beaches, was it? was over from the Minkies, but, but anyway, we could see these lights flashing, I don't know really why. And uh, and then we were all in great excitement and listening to news and rumours were abounded. <laughs> there was all rumours, have you heard such and such thing? Yes. And I suppose we didn't have a radio then because it had been confiscated. Um, and then, then, of course, that was a very difficult time for the islanders between D-Day and the liberation because because we were not getting any food in from from uh, France so you know this is where my husband for instance who lived in town I think his family's really suffered it's a pity my sister-in-law's not here because she could uh, give that side of the story and we used to have all sorts of people would come up to us to get eggs and anything including my my grandfather well he was married to my grandmother and and grandmother went away, and uh, and he used to come up on his bicycle to get eggs and anything that he could, and we would give give that to him. Although although he wasn't the most favourite person in our family, but um, but we you know, he we kept on reasonably good terms and um, helped him out where we could. Although we didn't know what he was he was harbouring a, all these people in, in his house, but he was. You know. We had, went on the beach and did some low water fishing for almas or cockles or whatever there was down there. And then coming back, we encountered this whole army of, of, of the slave workers. 
only with their feet all oh, bound in yes, sacking. Just bound in sacking, isn't it? Well, that really made an impression on me as well, you know, how people could be treated like that. Oh, the great thing, of course, then was the, the Red Cross parcels, which everybody who was here during the war remembers the Red Cross parcels. Yeah. They were the great big thing, you know, and um, so we went down with our handcarts and push chairs and everything else that you could find and, and got our, our, our parcels. We had a parcel each, I think. And, oh, and it was wonderful to open it up and have all these, have chocolate and, oh, Klim, Klim, K-I-L-M, Klim, 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 and Spam. Oh, that was really great. And uh, so it, 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 it was a wonderful treat and it saved many lives, I'm sure. But they weren't going to give up, the Germans. They said they would fight to the last. So we never knew until the day before liberation whether we were going to be liberated or not, or whether they were going to fight. The first thing my stepfather did was dig out his car, which had been buried under under straw for all through the occupation, because we weren't allowed to have cars. And, he, and then all he wanted to do was see all the bunkers and the tunnels and everything mm. else. And I'm sure we went up to Leilong, because that, there was even then there was an entrance there, and looked at, at that. And all I can remember about looking at the bunker was the smell. And I could say, I would call it the German smell. And everything that the Germans had been in had the smell. I, I'm, I can't really describe it at all, but I'd probably if I smelt it again. I suppose it was a mixture of leather and various things. But anyway, I went up to the Leyland and we went in there. And you know, I've never wanted to go into a bunker ever since. Funnily enough, you know, people say, oh, what a relief it must have been to you. And of course, it was in a way, but I did notice the day of the liberation, we've been all so close. At the minute the occupation finished, somehow everybody went back to their own houses and continued their life. And the neighbor, that lovely neighborhood feeling went that almost immediately. I'm sure for most people, it was probably such a great relief. For me, I missed it. I missed that, that camaraderie and that feeling of being together. Oh, what a lovely lad. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we're interviewing her, not you, Tony. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you were interested even then? 